<clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Super Agents Live, Toby Salgado here. If you are new to the show, I'm glad you found it. If you don't know what we do, we talk about entrepreneurship, but we do it in a unique way. The way we do it, we talk about entrepreneurship through the lens of a real estate agent. I bring on the top agents in the nation, people people putting down $100 million in volume, $200 million in volume, making $2 million, $4 million, $5 million in cash a year, and I ask them how they did it. Now, if you've recently found the show, it's because... Uh, for the last, I don't know, two weeks or so, three weeks, we've been featured on What's Hot, baby. And, man, we keep moving up the charts. Uh, and it's all to you guys listening, so I appreciate it. But, but uh, yeah, we were on um, the, the lower end of What's Hot. And then all of a sudden we moved to front and center. At what point our show was sitting right next to Tim Ferriss' show. And then, uh, and then we've hopped him. So I'm really excited about the role that we're on. Now, look, today's episode, today's super agent, a uh, guy named David Parnes. Now, David has a really interesting background. Uh, number one, he's the latest cast member on, uh, on uh, the hit TV show, Million Dollar Listing. And here's, here's what this guy did. He's his claim to fame, uh, I guess. I mean, look, the guy's young. He's 32. He's, he's got a lot, a lot of road to go. But um, here's what we talked about. We talked about how at 27, this guy had no track record, came from London, went out and started selling not one million, not two million, not five, ten million dollar houses. Because that's what he said. He said, "Listen, I'm gonna go. If I'm gonna do real estate, I'm gonna go big." And his mindset, he's got this very interesting mindset. And he's like, "Listen, if it's ever been done before, I can do it." That's his mindset, you know. And, and you know, and, and when talking about cash and big deals, he's like, "You know what?" He's like, "It is out there for the taking." And he's like, "Look, if somebody else has done it, you can do it. Why not you?" So. What we talked about, we talked about that stuff. We, we talked about how he started doing uh, international deals. He went out and found buyers in Europe, brought them to Los Angeles, Miami, New York, and, uh, and uh, the sort of like created his track record that way, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, we talked about how to stretch yourself, right? How to get outside of your comfort zone, which that's always a big deal. But he, 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 he tells us specifically sort of how he did it. Uh, he, we also talk about how to break into the ultra competitive market of ultra luxury real estate. Um, and, uh, and again, his background, this guy is a hedge fund guy. He went from, you know, he's a, he's a numbers geek, went from, you know, hedge fund and managing other people's money and, and going out and sourcing deals for other people to doing it himself. So I hope you like it. Before we get there, a little housekeeping. Number one, if you've left a review on iTunes, thank you so much. That helps the show. Maybe that's why we've been up in New and Noteworthy. I haven't read them out in a while, and uh, maybe I'll do that on the next episode. And if you haven't left a review, God, God I would love it. Um, the second thing, listen, we're, we're going to go over a lot of good stuff. And if you want to stay reminded and you don't want to miss anything, I'd love you to do two things. One, go to our site, superagentslive.com. Download my book. It's, I wrote a book, free ebook. I wrote, it's free, 52 pages called How to Sell. Read it. Let me know what you think. And the second thing, uh, subscribe to the show on iTunes. And again, if you're so inclined, leave a review. So that being said, I will tell you, today's sponsor is us. As you guys know or should know, we have a radio advertising arm to this uh, to this platform. And uh, if you want to, if you're out there, you have a team, uh, you want to add 100 transactions to your pipeline, radio is the vehicle that'll get you there. Now, for us, we only ha we, we only work with the top people in each market. We are also only focusing on the top 100 markets. Um, it just doesn't make sense for us. Uh, you know, we have a guy in Dallas that spends 20 grand a month. It doesn't make sense for us really to, to go to, you know, uh, 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 Mike Arrington's city, Poughkeepsie, you know, and, and have a $1,000 radio budget. Just, just, we can't, that, that's not scalable for us. So listen, if you're interested in radio, send me an email, let or go to the site, read, listen to my, uh, my videos on dominate with radio. And lastly, two things before we get to it, show hashtag unpack that idea. It's a big follow train. You tweet it out, use it. And for last, uh, if you are growing, and you feel like you need some help. You feel like you want to level up. I've talked Bob Corcoran because he loves what we're doing here. And Corcoran Coaching, is a, it's a, he's a smart guy, all smart guys down there. And I've had all the big trainers on. We've worked out a thing where he will give you, again, if you're growing, not if you're brand new in the industry, don't 
necessarily take them up on this offer, but he will spend do a, a free coaching session with you if you are wanting to level up and build a team and all that stuff. So I hope you like today's episode. David Parnes, let's get to it. Welcome to Super Agents Live. This is the one place where you can come and hear the most successful people in real estate. You'll hear how these super agents built their businesses, how they stay productive, and how they stay motivated. Who am I? My name's Toby Salgado, and I made my first million in real estate. And I'm your host for the next 30 minutes while we talk to yet another amazing real estate entrepreneur. Stay tuned. Let's go. Yeah. Today's super agent is a really interesting guy for a lot of reasons. Now, this guy started his career. He came from he came from Europe, came from London. He started his career working at a hedge fund before going on to amass a private portfolio of real estate assets in Europe. Now he's in America selling luxury property in Southern California and has just landed a spot on Bravo's hit TV show, Million Dollar Listing. I'm thrilled to welcome David Parnes. Hey David, thanks for taking the time out today. Thank you so much for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Hey, so look, I, I've given the audience a brief overview of your background, but you have a, a really interesting and varied background. Tell us a little bit about yourself to start off with, and then we'll get into your business. Absolutely. Um, I'm 32 years old. Uh, I was born and raised in London. Went to um, school, obviously, educated the normal way. Went to university, studied uh, economics and politics. Uh, went to work for a hedge fund straight from university. And really, I've always had an interest in real estate. My parents have always built houses that we've moved into, and I've always kind of taken a very <laughs> bizarre, uh, I suppose, over-interest in uh, the development process and the houses. When I was eight years old, I used to kind of ask them, say, can we go around now and go and look at the progress of the house and see how it's looking and look at all the details? And I was always fascinated. I was always drawn to houses. Um However, I went on to um, work for a hedge fund after university, um, and from that, I always just wanted to go into real estate. I actually started off doing commercial real estate, so I was um, working for an investor um, buying shopping centers, actually, in Europe. Um, but the economy took a turn for the worse in 07, 08, well, 08, really, um, and um, there were a lot of fires to put out, but it was a great experience, and that's when I moved to the States and really you know, moved back into developing real estate, started to build houses, and uh, set up uh, Bond Street Partners with my best friend and business partner, James Harris. Interesting. So, so, uh, so you're a young guy. Um, you know, so you've always had this passion about real estate. Now, why in the – so in, oh, you, uh, if I heard you right, David, you, yes. you, went, you came to America in 08. I mean, like the worst time in the history of real estate. <laughs> yeah, it was actually it was actually the beginning of '09. Okay. Um, I came to America um, really as to get back into real estate. I started trading commodities briefly, hmm. um, but I started to look for opportunities. And the reality is, when it's the worst time, that's when the opportunities really arise. That's when you can buy good deals. I actually bought a duplex in um, the West Hollywood area, um, and I converted that into a house. And people were like, what are you doing? Why would you convert the duplex into a single family house? It just, people, it didn't really make that much sense to people. And my thought process was if I actually turn it from a duplex into a single family house, I'm turning it, I'm, I'm making it appeal to another buyer. I'm taking it away from a number cruncher, someone who just mm. wants to park their money and get a fixed return, to someone who's emotionally going to fall in love with that house. You can always get a premium. Um, so I think I paid about eight hundred and sixty-eight thousand dollars for it. I put a few hundred thousand into it, and I sold it for like one point seven three million. So it, wow. it worked, and uh, it was it was pretty cool. So in answer to your question, it's really when things are terrible, that's where the opportunities arise. Yeah, I mean, look when you know when everybody's zigging, you got to zag. I mean, I think I think uh, it, it takes a certain kind of personality to do that. I agree with you. And look, I actually started buying. I started flipping houses uh, about the same time, early '09. You know, when everybody was scared, and I was, you know, listen, I don't want to talk about me, but but so so let's get into your personality a bit. I mean, that you you are a, a guy that's not scared of risk because look, in '09, in '09, yeah. nobody knew how long how deep was this was going to go. Nobody knew how long it was going to last. You, I mean, talk, let's talk about risk for a second and, and your personality and, and, you know, are you drawn to risk? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to a degree, it's got to be calculated risk. It's got to be, I wouldn't go into a new industry that I wasn't familiar with and, and, and just, you know, drop everything on, on a bet, so to speak. It would have to be a risk that I knew that I could get out of. There's always a worst case scenario. In this respect, if I bought this property and, you know, I had a good loan on it, I had decent equity invested in it, worst case scenario, the market got worse or didn't get better, I worked out that I could lease that property out and it would even even at lower than market rent at that time yeah. and it would still service the debt. It would still pay for the mortgage and that's really the sit out time. I could do that for five, six, seven years on that particular property. Um, and, and really that would sit out any bad market or worsening market so that was my get out there was always a, okay. a plan b there it wasn't it wasn't a foolish risk so to speak got it now let's shooting from the hips. got it okay and i, I, I want to ask just a few more questions before we move on to what you're doing today now Absolutely. so yeah here's what's interesting um so at the hedge fund you're playing with other people's money and then you went into commercial and you're working with an investor right you're playing with other people's money a lot of mm. people would would that's where they would stay because again this, this i guess this ties into risk a bit why did you move away from that? Because, I mean, look, everybody, you know, I would think would want to work at a hedge fund or want to work, at, you know, with a, a, a venture capital firm because um, it's a, normally an easy path to, to wealth. Um, why did you leave that, you know, working with other people's money and go and, and start doing your own thing? Um, really, I think when I worked for the hedge fund straight out of university, it was more of an experience thing. So I was really learning at that point. I wasn't, you know, I didn't have free reign over people's money. I actually worked under um, superiors. So I kind of did what they said, so to speak. That was more of an experience role. Got Having it. said that, when I, when, I did, when I did move into real estate and started to buy properties um, for an investor, they were highly leveraged properties. So it, it almost became finance transactions rather than property transactions mm. it was purely number motivated so um it was you know 90 percent leverage so we were borrowing from banks we were borrowing all different types of debt from senior debt to, to junior debt which could be mezzanine um, and there was very little equity that would be put into those properties so essentially they were very very leveraged deals and that's basically what was happening back then because finance was so freely available and that was part of what the problem that then followed yeah. stemmed from. So um, everyone was playing at that, and it was basically, okay, well, if I can borrow an X and, and, and buy a property that's going to give me Y and there's a slight margin in there, then that's fantastic. What people didn't realize is when they bought that property or those properties, um, the banks would end up failing, literally. Yeah. The banks that would spend the money, people are so concentrated on, okay, well, it's going to pay me X and you know it's going to cost me Y or vice versa. So I've got a good margin in there. My income's higher than my debt service. Uh, but what they didn't see coming is that the bank that loaned the money was about to fail. Yeah. And when the bank fails, everything collapses. Jeez. So that was, that was an amazing experience to have at a young age. I was in my early 20s and, you know, witnessing and being part of something so catastrophic. But at the same time, it was history in the making. And I think learning these experiences and going through these experiences when you really are just think, oh, my God. God, how am I going to get out of this? This is like beyond anything I've ever seen. And actually getting through them, and it takes many years, it really gives you a strong foundation to then go forward. And I felt very confident having gone through these experiences and actually seeing what I'd seen and experienced what I'd experienced with these markets, um, going off on my own and investing my own money, I was very, very confident. But when we were talking about risk, it was calculated risk. It was risk that I was very comfortable taking, and I always had a plan B. And that was very, very important, because if anything, coming out of that experience beforehand made me more prudent yeah. um, to, going forward. But it was a great experience. And, you know, you, you work very hard to, to get to a position, and then it all falls to pieces. And then the second time round, it's just that much more satisfying, you know, because... Yeah. You know, to, to make it, lose it, and then make it back again at such a young age, it's, it's, it's a really good feeling, I've got to tell you. Yeah, oh, no, I, 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 I agree. And look, I'll tell you, I mean, so for people who are listening to this in the future, um, mm. we're recording in October of 2014. And in a lot of ways, you know, David, I think that, you know, if in 2020, 2018, right, once we get away from this, this – because uh, we just got out of this, right? Oh nine, you know, we, we, yeah. 2012, we started to get our legs. And I think there's going to be fantastic books written about – about 
all the facets. And I think, you know, those books haven't really been written today just because we're still, we're, you know, we're still struggling. We're just getting, shaking it off. So, so today, David, you are in an enviable position. Um, you, you are now selling luxury real estate. And when I say luxury, this, these are 10 million, very, very expensive houses. Everybody wants to get there. Um, how, talk to us a little bit about your path in, 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 in getting to this ultra high end luxury market. Yeah, absolutely. It's very competitive because you've got to think to yourself, everyone wants to sell the biggest houses and the best houses. And being a broker, being a, an, an agent, um, anyone can get their license and really give it their best shot. It, you don't necessarily need millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to set up. You can just get your license and then just go for it. So it's very, very competitive. So when myself and James, my business partner, set up Bond Street Partners, um, it was back in 2011. We really had to think what is going to give us the edge aside from the fact that we have a you know good work ethic and we don't tend to give up we really really give it everything um it was we needed some unique selling points so to speak mm -hmm. and really we just kind of you can hear it when we speak it was our accent the point is that we we are international we grew up in london and europe and we grew up around uh, an incredible network of very successful high net worth um, individuals who are family, friends, many of them, uh, acquaintances, but we had those contacts. And what we noticed was more and more international money was coming into the States. Now, a lot of it's coming from Asia, but a lot of it's coming from Europe as well. So if you look at prices in the U.S., in, in Los Angeles, uh, even, even New York and Miami, who are, which, which have really got very expensive right now, but if you look at Los Angeles particularly relative to London, or um, a lot of cities in Europe, um, you notice that it's very good value. Even now, when the market's so strong, it's very, very good value. You can buy the most amazing house with the biggest lot, biggest land, beautiful swimming pool, brand new construction, top of the range appliances, you name it. You could buy that for under $1,000 a foot in West Hollywood right now. Now, if you compare that to London, the best area in London could be trading for around $10,000 a foot. So although $1,000 a foot sounds like a lot of money and it's surely grown a lot in a very short period of time, it's very, very good value. It represents very good value when you compare it to London. So when you've got people that are psychologically used to hearing, you know, $5,000, $6,000, $10,000 a foot, and they see $1,000 a foot, and you get a whiz for $1,000 a foot, it's very, very attractive, and we've really capitalized on that and marketed it very heavily to the international clients and our contact base, and that's really what gave us a running start, just the ability to relate to the international buyer and bring them in and represent them on a lot of transactions, and really the rest is history. We built a business around doing deals initially with that in mind. Interesting. Okay, so that's how you get your sort of foothold. Um, and and does it work like this, David? You know, once you you know once you start selling a few houses in Beverly Hills, I mean, are you then the Beverly Hills guy that that the you know other people not from Europe they're comfortable you know with you and your name and your firm? Well, that's the thing. Once you start getting a foothold, once we started doing transactions and really learning and appreciating the market, um, we were able to get a track record. It's kind of like chicken and egg when you first start up an agency. Yeah. I mean, how are you meant to get listings when you haven't got a track record? And, and that's the biggest problem because you've got nothing to sell. What we managed to do is represent a lot of buyers and close a lot of transactions. So what had happened was um, we were setting records in Bel Air and uh, the Hollywood Hills and, and a lot of transactions we did, we were really setting records in. Um, so what we found out was a lot of people that lived around that area, we would send out newsletters to every single month and just giving a market update and showing some transactions that we've recently completed, typically that we'd represented the buyer on. And they started to notice us. And we actually got some phone calls saying, well, look, I heard that you sold this property and you represented the buyer and you got a phenomenal price for the seller on that. Do you think you could do that for us as well? Mm. And we were like, well, sure, absolutely. So we would go and meet with those people. These are homeowners in prime Bel Air and the Hollywood Hills and Beverly Hills area. And we would go and meet with them with relatively little track record. But the little track record we had were, were very, very specific 
deals that really broke records, quite frankly, and set a precedent a lot of the time. Yeah. And they were intrigued, and, and they would give us a shot, not not always give us the listing. Sometimes they just we'd go to the property and we'd just bring the buyer straight straight away and you know close a deal or not close a deal. Maybe that one would fall out and we'd bring another buyer, but we typically, as I say, we don't give up. Um, we'd end up typically doing the transaction. They'd be impressed. They'd tell us about this. They'd tell their friends about us if they live in Bel Air, and a lot of their friends would live in Bel Air or Beverly Hills or the Sunset Strip. And um, the rest really is history. We'd start to to meet with their friends and sell their properties. And then we started to actually get the listings because they trusted us in that respect. So we'd be able to actually actively market the properties. That's where we really capitalized in getting our brand out there. Um, and we spent a lot of money on marketing and advertising. And really, we just build a business around being able to expose our brand and continue to build our track record. And right now, it's much easier for us to get listings because we're known and we have a very firm track record and we have a very, very good success rate. So it's just slowly but surely, but just heading on the right path and building a business by just closing deals and getting as many listings as possible based on our performance. Yeah. Well, and look, I mean, you guys have the accent and you guys have a cool name, Bond Street. But, <laughs> but, but so here's what I'm trying to figure out, David. So you guys had, you yeah. know, your unique selling proposition, your unique angle was you had in your back pocket or in your Rolodex, or whatever, some very wealthy people and you, you went out and that's, that's how you got your foot. If, if you didn't have that for somebody in my audience who says, man, I want to be like David. Uh, like, mm-hmm. can they do it, or is or is it just so competitive that like go find another pond to fish in? Anyone can do anything. I mean, what it really boils down to—it sounds so cliche. You know, your only limits are those that you don't genuinely believe in. And I think that anyone can achieve anything as long as they put their mind to it. And it's just not giving up. If you're willing to work harder than that next person or the other hundred people, chances are, especially at the beginning, chances are you will succeed because a lot of um, business, a lot of real estate is a numbers game. Um, what James and I also did is door knocks. I mean, mm. you've got to do it in the right areas. You've literally got to go and pound the pavements. It's actually quite funny because we go together in the car, we'd, we'd drive up the street, and one of us would we kind of do a rock, scissors, paper <laughs> tournament to see who's actually going to get out of the car and door knock. It was actually hilarious. And um, we'd take turns and we'd literally um, door knock and God, I mean, literally, that's like a, you knock 100 doors, you're lucky to get one good response. So it's very, very time consuming, but that one response could turn into a listing, and that one listing could promote our business, and that promotion for our business could get us more listings. So really, it's, it's, it's that, it's, it's branding, it's um, newsletters, it's going out, going to events, speaking with people, meeting with people, um, learning the market, really having an interest in real estate so that people actually believe you people actually believe your opinion because it's coming from the heart and it's coming from your experience and something you have a passion about so i think if you have a passion about it which james and i certainly do and did um that shows people buy into that and they believe that so i think just hard work um yeah keeping establishing a brand door knocking if you have to um going to events meeting with people networking Um, really studying and learning the area that you want to hit up, basically. These are all really important parts. And the more energy and the more time you give to it, the more likely you are to see a positive result. And once you start to get that first listing or that first sale, it's addictive. You just got to keep going and capitalizing and building and building and building until you look back and you think, wow, I've actually closed quite a few deals now. Yeah. And so, so I, I, that's amazing to me, David, that, that you would go door knocking in the kind of neighborhoods that you're playing. And again, you know, we're talking, you know, five, ten million dollar houses. I think most people, David, would would look at that kind of neighborhood and and just go forget it. You know, these people, I, you know, they're 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 all multimillionaires. They're maybe famous. You know, I have no business talking with them. D- did you you know, did you ever have any of those mindset issues? Well, first things first, you've got to make sure when you door knock in areas that you're allowed to. There's some areas, mm. specifically at Beverly Hills, that you're actually not allowed to. So you have to make sure that you're door knocking in the right areas. But you know what? Fear is is it's false. It's, it's not real. It's 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 a, it's a bad fantasy. And the point is that if you're not going to do it, the next person is going to do it, and they're going to be hugely successful. And you know, there's a lot of new territory um, that that needs to be unfolded in order to 
to become successful, you know, because if, if we're not going to do it, someone else is going to do it. Of course, that's why we played rock, scissors, paper. Right. We were like, no, you're going to go at door knock on that door. But the point is that one of us had to do it and we typically took turns. And yeah, of course, it, it's scary. Everything new is scary. Going into a new industry is scary. Meeting new people can be scary. But the more you do it, the more you get used to it. And once you start to get used to certain things which you're uncomfortable with, it's easier to take on other things. And, you know, because it's all new and you're constantly building, we're constantly doing new things. But the more you do it, the easier it gets. Yeah, no, I, I would I would absolutely 100% agree with that. I mean, uh, I don't know. I'm going to ask you. I hate when I'm interviewed. I hate when people ask me this, the kind of question that I'm about to ask you. So you oh, s- no, not at all. <laughs> so you said, hey, look, you know, fear is false. Fear is fantasy. And, and and of course, you also said, hey, the, the more you do, it, it's like a muscle. You, you you just get better and better at it. Is there is there sort of a tip or a trick that you used early on to, to control that fear and to, to, you know, and to really just imprint it on your 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 brain or your person? That, hey, this is this is this fear that I'm feeling is not real. I have to I have to beat it. Um, it's, a very, it's a very good question. I mean, yes, I mean, throughout my childhood, throughout. A lot of times I've, I've been very, very scared. You know, I, I am a fearful person, but you typically see results that are completely different to what the fear was telling you. And the more I can only speak in the eye, the more I I, I go through these experiences and realize that my, my fear, what I thought was going to happen, was was wrong. Mm. It's, it's easier to kind of push it to the side. And, you know, it's like the, like the cartoons when we were young and you got the little what is it, the fairy on one side and the devil on the other side yeah. and they're telling you it's do this, it's going to be whatever the bad stuff and the fairy's telling you it's going to be okay. It's kind of like you listen to that fairy more than the devil and as time goes by, you just realize through results that you take on these risks and sometimes, you know, when we're, we're knocking on a hundred doors and we think it's not getting us anywhere or when we're writing these newsletters and sending them out or, you know, calling our contacts endlessly and we're not getting a good response, you just feel, oh, oh this is just not working but, Something has to keep you going. You just have to keep going, and it's normally when you're when you're not believing in it, and you really think that everything's not going well, that you get that turn. Just that one little shine of light. Yeah. That's all you need, and that's what I've noticed. You get that little glimmer. You get that call. You get that good response. You get that one lead, and you just jump on it, and you follow through with it. And if and when it comes to anything, it's just the most amazing feeling. And and once you do it once, why can't you do it a hundred, two hundred, a thousand times? You know, yeah. it works. It's a formula. And other agents are doing it. Other agents are selling properties, and they've got there by not giving up. And and really, that's what it's about. The industry's proven it's there for the taking. It's just whoever mm. is going to work harder and 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 be creative and, and not give up is going to succeed. I love that, man. I love that. And, and it's that one little glimmer that you know. I mean, it literally can change your life. Um, so so. Yeah. David, t- tell us about this real quick. So, in terms of marketing, I know you you know you're going out and you you picked a little farm. You guys did no- door knocking. Uh, w- w- other than the newsletter, what you, you said you spent a lot of money on marketing. What what did that look like? What kind of marketing things did you do for a high end luxury farm like you had? Well, well, because we were actually going to we were focusing on the high end. Now, don't get me wrong, we would we would take anything. We would do any listing or go for any property, but. We just thought that if we're going to put the effort in, we may as well focus on the high end, which we did. Um, we created a website which we had saved a lot of money to do. Everything we kind of made from doing a deal, we kind of put into our branding. So a lot of the money that we made at the beginning was just invested into our business to actually create the platform, to create the brand, um, which was Bond Street Partners. And at the time we were working under a brokerage. So what happens is you hang your, we're salespeople, so we hang our licenses up with a brokerage. And the brokerage has allowed us as a team to brand ourselves. And that was Bond Street Partners. We made an incredible website, which we still have today. It hasn't changed very much because it, it really is very clean. It's very um, new. It's very um, modern. And it's very young and fresh. Really shows it, really portrays us correctly, in my opinion. So our website was very, very important. We started to do video blogs. So everyone was doing blogs. We thought to ourselves, um, why don't we do video blogs, which is a video version of a blog. You know, yeah. Some people like reading. Some people actually like to watch it. So we, we really researched and got a, a, a guy that we could afford and um, got him to a couple of our listings, and we gave some intros into 
the areas that we were working in on video, literally on camera. And we uploaded them onto our website um, and we kind of emailed them out to clients. And people were like, well, you know, noticing that this is not because of us, but because they'd never really seen this concept that much about, at, at the time, video blogs. That's, that's pretty cool. So that got a lot of attention. Um, that was, a, again, a unique selling point that we were kind of trying to portray. Um, what we also did was the newsletters. We kept everything very clean and very consistent. Our branding was always very, very consistent so that people would see the Bond Street Partners brand and know who we were. And it was actually very interesting. When James and I moved to the agency, um, I was sitting in a restaurant and I bumped into a, a, a co-worker, someone that, that didn't notice my face in the office but didn't know me by name. And I said, hi, I'm David Barnes, nice to meet you. He goes, oh, hi, nice to meet you too. And I said, um, of Bond Street Partners. And then he kind of like froze. He goes, oh, Bond Street Partners. You, he kind of, I did, he knew Bond Street Partners, but he didn't know David Barnes. Mm. And that was quite amazing, actually. And it was a great feeling because I don't care if he recognized my name or not, but what James and I created, our brand, he really, his eyes lit up and he really knew Bond Street Partners. That was such a good feeling because it just proved that we really were building our brand very, very strong. And they called us the Bond Street Boys, uh, Bond Street Guys, and, and it was it was just a great feeling because people, brokers and clients were really catching onto our brand. Um, so I'm sorry it's a very long winded answer. No, no, that's a good. That's great. No, I, I I love it. I love it. So. You know, it, it seems like you know. Being first of all, I gotta say, you, you, you know, you're 32 years old. You're 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 a millennial. You're young, um, uh, but you seem wise for 32, right? Just the way that you you, you talk. I mean, I, you know, I guess maybe it's your background. But d- was that a problem early on? Uh, so you were in your 20s, late 20s, when you started Bond Street Partners. Now, was that a problem with you going and saying, hey, I'm 29 years old, I'm 26 years, seven or whatever it is, and saying, I can sell your $10 million house? I mean, yes, it's always more difficult, especially when you've got, you've got no track record as well. Yeah. So there you are, you're in your 20s and you've got no track record. How are you going to do a six and a half, $10 million deal? You can. It, it, the only thing that's going to stop you from doing it is not believing in yourself. It's, 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 it's proven. People have done it for years and I'm not taking anything away from myself or James, but the point is that we've done it and before us, other people have done it as well. And that's all I need to know. If it's physically possible and it's been done before, then why is anything going to stop me from doing it? And as long as I had that mindset, nothing was going to stop myself to do that or James. Got it. I love it. I love it. So um, in, you said, hey, you got to go out to events and meet people. Now, how um, – I'm just curious how you, uh, other than door knocking and other than sending out your, you know, your video blog, which, uh, you know, which I love. And look, it's even still in 2014, everybody knows video works, but they still don't mm-hmm. do it. You know, um, how did you, uh, what other ways did you get out and meet people that, that are, you know, that would own a $5 million or, or $10 million house? There was actually, um, aside from obviously door knocking and, and, mm-hmm. and pounding the phone as well, when, when you sit down and you literally write down everyone you know and then everyone they know and then you call them up and then they might not have a house to sell or they might not want to sell their house but they may know someone who does it, it this numbers game it's a huge numbers game you just got to keep making a lot of phone calls that's one thing um the other thing is literally identifying opportunities so okay a lot of spec homes were going up in bel-air a lot of spec homes were going up in the sunset strip bollywood hills at that time that's when people were really starting to think well wait a minute i can buy these are developers i can buy this property for two three million i can knock it down because it's a very small house on a very large piece of land relatively and i can build a seven thousand square foot house or an 8,000 or even a 10,000 square foot house and sell that for like 10 million bucks. So I buy for two, I spend maybe two, three on it. So I'm in for four or five and I could probably sell that house for 10 based on what the comps are showing me. That's a huge margin. That, that's a huge opportunity. Um, so a lot of developers were looking for these sorts of deals. Now developers aren't going to be knocking on doors or, or um, really actively looking for deals. They rely on agents to get those deals for them. And James and I were very, very aware of that. So we met 
we, we started to network with a lot of developers as well. These are just different opportunities. This is just keeping our eyes out, out at what, what we're noticing going on in the market. That's why it's really important to be plugged into the market. And that's what gave us direction. So what we would do is we would meet with a lot of developers. Now, a developer will want to meet with as many agents as they can because any of those agents could, for them, it's a numbers game as well. One of those agents could be the one that delivers that great deal to the developer. So they, that, no developer I know is ever going to turn down a deal from anyone. Do you know what I mean? Oh, so yeah, I could, absolutely. I, I pull up an agent and say, I've got a great deal for you. So it was a great way to tap into the market because we would drive around and really look for opportunities. And we would notice, well, that's a very small, decrepit house that really could be torn down on, on a very good piece of land and it has great views or it's very well located it's near a hotel or whatever it is, that would work for a developer because they could buy it for a round two, again, spend two or three on it and sell it for 10 because that's basically, it's a, it's a cookie cutter deal, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So we identified a lot of those opportunities and we actually literally went to our developers that we would be meeting and finding um, a lot of developers are easy to find. And we'll tell them, we'll say, we've got this great deal. It works. The numbers make sense. And it could be great. And obviously, they're going to be intrigued. You perk their interest. You, you take them to see the property. You sell the deal. The seller's delighted because you've just broken a record as far as what they've sold their house for. Um, and um, the developer's happy because they've got a deal that has a great margin on it. And not only have you represented a buyer and a seller, but once that developer build that house the chances are they're going to give you the listing to sell it right so working with developers is an amazing thing and anyone could do what we did if, if you identify a deal if you find a developer and you offer them that deal they buy it you're set because they don't a developer doesn't give a damn if you're 40 years old 15 20 30 15 it doesn't matter if you've got a deal that makes sense for them and you could deliver that deal they're going to buy it Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, look, and that, it, it, you know, it's I this is a question I, I hear all the time from people and it's like, oh, I can't find money. And I think money is so easy to find. If you have a deal you, like it's so easy to find money and look and for you, those del- developers are pretty easy for the most part to locate because you just have to drive around, figure out who's building what, you know, stop in and say, hey, you know, this is you know, I'm I'm David and, and uh, I find deals. Um, and I'm sure that's what you did. Now, it, this is a, an odd question. Now, did you ever, I mean, cause if I was in your shoes, I can either one, yeah. take, take my commission on, on, you know, buying the property and then selling the property. That's one thing. But did you ever say, Hey, I have this deal. You know, I think the margin, uh, is, you know, you're going to have five in, we can get 10 out. I'm not going to take any commission, but I want a piece of the, I want a piece of the, the, the upside. Did you ever d- do anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. We've done it. We've actually come close on a, on a very large deal to rolling our fee into it. Then what actually happened is we, we, we were in escrow with the developer and then we ended up, another client of ours, was in, it was such a great deal that we almost like just stepped aside and said, look, you know what, to our client that was buying the property, we said, look, this guy wants to come in with you because it's so good. And we actually stepped aside from our commission that we were actually going to put into the deal. And we said that we'll step aside and we'll just allow this guy to take our portion of the equity. And we did. And the relationship that developed between those two contacts that we put together led to about five other deals that were done between those two developers that we actually introduced. So we were taken care of on all of those deals. So by actually, we believed in the deal so much, we wanted to roll our fee into it. We weren't able to because the deal was so good that we ended up another developer wanted to come on board with that developer. And again, since then, they've done a lot of deals. So yes, but typically what I've been doing is building my own project. So you accumulate fees from transactions. And you know, the, the main way I do is I don't have kids at the moment. Um, I have a girlfriend who I love and hopefully we'll get married. But right now I have two dogs. But right now <laughs> I don't have to, the responsibility of kids. So I don't need to be living in a big house myself right now. So I've been building. I'm building a 4,000 square foot house right now in West Hollywood. I own a duplex uh, also around the Beverly Center Miracle Mile area that I have leased out right now. Um, and I'm looking to buy a house to tear down and build a new house to actually live in myself right now. So I, I'm actually quite active as far as buying investment properties and developing as well. Having said that, James and I are always willing to roll our fees into deals if the developer likes that, if the developer wants us to. Yeah. But a lot of the time, developers just want to do it themselves, and they kind of know the deal that we deliver them is good because they can look at it, they can look at the numbers, um, and they trust us too. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, look, you're 32. You're going to be a very wealthy man 10 years from now at, when you're at 42. Well, 
money's not everything. I think, and it sounds again cliche, but it, it, I look at it as, as the money is a byproduct of doing what we love to do. It's, it's as simple as that. Don't get me wrong. Money's great, but it's, I look at it as though I, I do what I love. It's as simple as that. I love what I do, and it does it does reward you with a lot of money, but that's not my main focus. My main focus is, is really doing what I do, selling the best real estate, getting to walk around incredible houses, building the best houses, seeing them being built, being part of that is a great, great feeling. And again, yes, the money is great, but it, it's, it's not my main priority yeah that's awesome that's all awesome. well so so i mean speaking of you know money's not everything and you, and you love doing what you're doing if, if i think about what you're doing right now and i'm, I'm curious so number one uh so you have a, a a brokerage that you're growing or a team that you're growing number one number two you know you're you're buying investment property and building houses building you know uh, property up uh, and three now you have this tv show uh, so mm-hmm. so before we get into how you got on the show Mm. If for you, David, ten years from now, where what do you see your world looking like? Ten years from now, yeah. <laughs> well, I'd like to see. I'd like to be married. I'd like to have kids. Um, I'd like to think that looking back, I've been of service and I've given back. Because although we've worked for everything we've got, I there's there's a lot of people that have helped me along the way that I look back on mentors, people that have given us direction, um, people that have been good to us and believed in us. That 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 I look at as gifts. And I'd like to think that the more success that I get or we get, the more I'm able to give back and help other people um, and inspire other people and, you know, not to give up and believe in themselves so that they can achieve success. But I think that above more than anything is, is, is not letting my ego get to me, being humble mm. and, and always maintaining humility and asking how I can be of service to help other people, not just to focus on myself, but to really put a lot of energy into other people as well. And I'd like to think that I, in 10 years from now, aside from having a family and being with a girl that I love, who, who I believe I'm with at the moment, and have built a great team with a great partner who's also my best friend, I'd like to think that I've, I, I've given back and, and inspired and helped a lot of other people. Um, yeah, no, that, be successful and, that's and happy. Right. And look, I think just by you doing this episode, I think you're going to inspire people. I'm inspired. But but so but let me ask you how you know you have to you have to at some moments during the day or the week or the month you have to sort of go man I can do anything I'm Superman everything I touch you know works how do you stay humble when when you are you know when, when you're doing what you're doing you're on a TV show and you know you're you know how do you how do you keep that humility David success I mean success always looks uh, very clean cut. From, from, from the outside, but really, I mean, the truth of it is things go wrong every day. There's fires to put out every day. There's deals that fall out of escrow. There's, there's disasters that happen. I mean, it's, it's not easy, and this is a daily thing. You don't hit success, and then suddenly it's all plain sailing. It's quite the opposite. It's constantly dealing, and, and that's part of the excitement about it, the challenge, is constantly dealing with problems after problem after problem, but it's how you deal with those problems. It's how you put out those fires that really determines how successful you will be and continue to be. So every day I'm humbled by the issues that we face. And um, even more so, I think, just by being grateful. I'm so Mm. grateful for everything in my life. I'm so grateful for where we are right now and what we've been able to achieve. And that gratitude kind of smashes up the ego and, uh, and, and just, you know, as long as I'm grateful, I'm, I'm going to be humble and, and I'm grateful for everything. Every day I'm focusing on writing down a list of a gratitude list of, mm. of, of things that I'm grateful for. I'm actually sober, so I haven't um, had a drink in six, six and a half years. Um, that's part of, you know, something that, you know, I've, I've learned that, you know, to really be grateful. I, I work a program. I, I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous, so I actually work a program and, um, I take it very seriously. Um, sometimes I'm not great at it. Sometimes I am, but I, I'm just focused on being grateful and for the good in my life and that I don't need vices to get me through. I can channel my energy into positive things and, and be humble and believe that I'm not running the show. I'm, I'm merely just a worker, a servant of God, so to speak, without getting too deep. But I'm, I'm, I'm just able to stay humble because I'm grateful for everything I have in my life. That is great. That's a great answer. And I'll tell you that, 
that starting your day with gratitude is something that I try to do and I just I you know it, it's amazing it helps when when you do it for me it, it, like my day is different when I start that in the morning now again I need to make it more I'm 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 hit or miss so yeah talk to us about the you know and let's hope that Hollywood doesn't you know wreck with your uh, with your soberness um, how yeah. how did the show come about the show came about James and I had had, had been you know doing our deals you know working doing what we do. Um, and we got a call out of the blue, and I think it was a lot about how we branded ourselves. We had the Facebook page, Bond Street Partners Facebook page. We had the website, and we've been doing deals. We've been advertising, we've been marketing, and we got a call from a casting company, and they said, "Look, we're 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 um, we're casting for Million Dollar Listing, season seven, and it's my favorite bloody show. I love it. I mean, I've watched every single season. I was like, try to keep my cool, you know." Uh, and just thinking, yes, okay, well, that sounds interesting. And um, they said, would you guys be interested? And, and, and we were like, well, absolutely. They go, okay, we'll, we'll set up a Skype call with you. So we set up a Skype call, and, um, and, and we did. And then I believe what happened was, I could only see it from our perspective. Then they said, okay, well, we, we like you guys. We want to send out the camera crew and shoot with you for the day. So they shot with us for the day at one of our listings. And then that was it, silence. I was like, okay, well, that, that was interesting bloody tiring day but <laughs> of shooting you think that shooting's not tiring it's really tiring but um what's going to come of it so then we got a call and we said yeah, apparently there were hundreds of agents that had, had, had gone to these positions we didn't, we didn't even realize at the time i mean I, I love the show but i didn't know the numbers um and then we got a call and said you guys are the guys we, we, we want you guys on the show we were like oh wow that's like crazy and they go okay so we're ready to shoot now so um that was it i mean from then on that moment on we were shooting. It was the beginning of April until literally now. We're still pretty much finishing up. So it was uh, it was intense, but what a journey it's been, and it is incredible. It's so so exciting, and to be with Josh Altman and Josh Flagg, who are like my idols. I mean, I, I I love these guys. I knew who they were. I've watched them for years on TV, and I admire them as realtors. It's it's an incredible. It's just an incredible feeling. Wow, amazing! And that, and that casting company that reached out to you was it was it Big Fish Casting? No, it was the casting company, I believe, Galoka Bolte. She's mm. she's great. Got it. Um, yeah, because well, well, I just asked because I had a similar thing for this show. Uh, I had a similar thing. A, a, a casting company reached out to to me um, for uh, I think I, I don't know if it's a Bravo show or HGTV, but it was uh, they're doing a new um, pilot called Realty Ref, and and you know they. We did the whole thing, and I, you know, I guess I wasn't right for it. But it's amazing when that when you get that call, and you're like, "Wow, you know, somebody's paying attention to what I'm doing." Um, so uh, that that okay. And look, Josh Josh Flag's been on the show. We've had a lot of those guys, so that is really cool. Now, listen, I love him. yeah, and I'll tell you, in real life, uh, he's he, he's very very flat to to be interviewed. To be totally honest with you, and, but in real life, he's a really cool guy. But uh, for some reason, I don't know, he's he's not made for radio. Um, and I know, and that's whatever. He's a good guy. I'm not saying anything bad about him. Um, so I'm going to ask you a question. We're going to start wrapping up here. I'm going to ask you a question that, that I, I rarely ask, but again, just because you have such an interesting background, I'm going to ask it. Here it is. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's not hard. And look, if, if you don't have an answer, don't answer. But, but it's, it, it, I'm just curious about, you know, um, what's something I, I didn't ask you that I probably should have asked you, David? Oh, what's something that you didn't ask that you probably should have? Yeah. Um, do I have any brothers or sisters? <laughs> um, what's something that that is a really really interesting question? Um, maybe why do you do what you do? No, I know what you love it. I know you love it. That's why you do what you yeah, do. Yeah, you probably sit in you. Um, it's a good question. I, I think you really covered a lot of a lot of uh, everything pretty much. Good. Um, we even covered my sobriety, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, one thing is animals. I mean, I, I, I love animals. I love people who love animals, and I don't trust people who don't love animals. Yeah. They're the only people I trust. I, I have two bats at home, rescues, Maxie and Bella, and I love them. They are the purest form of existence. They are so frigging cute. It's ridiculous. And you know what? How do I, how do I decompress every day? That's yeah. That, that's the answer. How do I, how do I like, kind of try and clear my head? How do you? At my dog. Being with my dogs, looking at my dogs, they are everything. Being with my girlfriend as well, um, but they just bring me to a more relaxing level. 
You know, if there's any way to de- any, ever a way to decompress aside from going to the gym, I would definitely say being with my dogs and my girlfriend is what makes it all worthwhile. Because for me, that that's still the most important thing in my life. No, I love it. And look, and you know, I, I you know, in the studio right now, I have my two dogs. Well, I have three, but I have two uh-huh. of them. Two of them with me all the time. Uh, and literally, like one dog, I took from my neighbor um, just because he got so attached. I, you know, we all have sort of glass door showers, right? Wherever I go, yeah. he follows. I get in the shower, and he sits on the mat and watches me shower. And wherever oh, I, I go, <clears throat> so. It's awesome. Well, look, man, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna ask you the last two questions that I ask everybody, and it's this: What dog do you have? What what are your dogs? So they're all rescues. So so I have a German Shepherd, I have another Uh, Shepherd kind of hound mix, and then I have uh, the one that I got from my neighbor is a Jack Russell. Oh, how sweet! I love it. Oh, I love you now. I loved you before, (laughs) but now I love you even more. That's incredible. Um, So here here's the last two. Um, I'm a I'm a I'm an aspiring agent, David. I have 25 bucks. What book should I go buy today? That's a really good question, actually. You're not a reader. No, I'm not really. Well, no, I probably 25 bucks. I even have a price in the book. So you probably go online now and read it for free. But that's a, that's a very very good question. Um, because I'm not much of a reader, I would probably take that 25 bucks. And I'd probably fill up my tank of gas and I'd probably drive around a neighborhood that I really liked and just learn it. That's probably what I'd do. And I know that's not the most um, orthodox of answers. And I know it doesn't make me sound very intellectual by the fact that I don't read very much. But I like experiences. I'm one of those people that just need to get out there and see things. And i take that 25 bucks, I'd put it to gas in my car. And I would, gen- if I had a car or even take the bus and just whatever, go around and learn a neighborhood. Go and see it firsthand because yeah. that's what you've been selling at the end of the day. I love it. And, and look, you know, here I had one guy answered in a similar way. He said, listen, real estate is all about meeting people. I would take that 25 bucks and I would go get a shoe shine and then go out and meet people. Yeah, why not? That would be a bloody good shoe shine for 25 bucks. <laughs> <I know. one. laughs> So, so I know you do. I want to just. Here's my last question. I know you do a gratitude sure. journal, but it's this: Do you have any personal habits that you feel have contributed your, to your success? Yeah, I mean, I'm very obsessive compulsive. I like everything neat and in its place and very organized. And sometimes I take it to the next level, which is not good because it's just too much fixation on having everything organized and everything straight on my desk and everything in order. Um, but it's very difficult for me to leave an un, an email unread. So. In other words, I'm always on top of my shit, so mm. to speak. I'm always on top of my things. I'm always reading my emails. I'm always responding to people. I'm always, um, I know where everything is. And, and I think in any organization, I mean, it's, it's, it's as important as anything is to be organized and to know where everything is and to have a good system because by being organized enables us to create good systems and having good systems enables us to do the right follow-up with clients. Um, not drop the ball on anything, be on top of everything, um, make sure that clients don't feel that they've been forgotten about, make sure that anything you promise to a client, you deliver on. And I think that all comes down to, well, not all of it, but a lot of it comes down to being organized correctly. So being obsessive compulsive, being OCD has worked in my favor in that we run a really tight organization. Got it. Got it. Small, 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 but tight. Yeah. Well, David, look, I got to tell you, I, I wish you much, much continued success. And I know that, uh, you know, you're always people. You, again, I'm inspired by this. I'm sure a lot of other people are going to go that David is a great guy. I'm sure you're always looking for talent. Uh, maybe tell us where people can find you and, you know, and potentially ask to, to join your team and work with a guy like you. Absolutely. That, firstly, that's really kind of you. Um, that's really, really sweet of you. And I really, really appreciate that. Um, I'm at the agency. <laughs> That's where I am. It's Mauricio's company. So um, you want to get me, you can find me online, Bond Street Partners. Um, the agency, re.com is the website, bondstreetpartners.com. Um, and you can just Google me, David Part. Not difficult to find, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, David, thanks, man. Uh, let's keep in touch. Lovely. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Are we, we're not on air right now. Are no, we? no, no. We're, we're off. Okay, thank you so much. Was that okay? It was, it- Let's go!